Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we're going to bring the family into the chapel. Officiating today will be Rabbi Karen Kadar, Rabbi Emeritus of Congregation B'nai Jehoshua Beth Elohim, and Rabbi Eitan Weiner Kaplo, also Rabbi Emeritus of Shir Chadash Congregation, also son-in-law. At this time, I invite everyone to please rise and stand in place as the Weiner family enters the chapel. Please be seated. The sacred ceremony of Kriya was done earlier. We, again, once again, we welcome those of you who are joining us via live stream. And for those of you who are here, please take a moment to be sure your phones are silenced. We are so sorry for your loss. And I know that the family was huddled just now in a very large group hug in that very small room. But you should turn around just for a second to see how many people are here. This is a testament to not only the intimacy of the love of your inner circle, but also the people who have showed up for the entire family. As is our custom, we begin with the Psalms. Lo 
Even though I walk through the valley of the darkest of shadows, I will fear no evil, for God, you are with me. I'm going to invite those who have the pamphlets that we received on arriving today to turn to the inside panel and join with me in reading the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As we begin these funeral services for Eleanor Weiner, let me take just a few moments to thank you all for coming today. Friends, family, members of our congregations, to my fellow clergy, so numerous I wouldn't even begin to name you because there are so many clergy here and I thank you all for coming. Thank you everyone, it brings such comfort to the whole family. Thank you for your presence today. Mickey, Robin, Steve, Don, Rabbi Eitan Weiner Kaplo, Alyssa, Eric, Scott, Ariel, Ayad, Tyler, Ilana, Abe, Joe, Josh, Seth. Did I get you all? I missed the cousins, the aunts and uncles. You are truly a tribe. You did good. You and Eleanor did good. Going forth in this world are generations who love you so much and who will sing your praises. This is a story that is magnificent and will be told over and over and over again at your holiday meals. Every time you get together, I'm sure you'll say, hey, remember that story? Tell that to me one more time. Some of them will make you laugh. Some of them will make you sit quietly in sadness. This is just the beginning or perhaps even the middle of that entering into stories. For now, I'd like to invite Robert Shipley up, a beautiful, beautiful soul to Eleanor, a special relationship, to say a few words. And after he is finished, I'll invite Eric Shore to come. Eleanor, Elke, Schwester, mom, auntie, my second mom, and on a point of personal privilege, the last direct connection to my mother. Compassionate, warm, loving, energetic, talented, vivacious, happy, always well put together, fully engaged in life, and sharp as a tack. So many ways to describe a person, a woman, who has touched all of our lives in so many different ways. For me, my Auntie Eleanor was a soft place to land, always willing to listen, and candid with her advice and thoughts. Being at or going to Auntie Eleanor's and Uncle Mickey's was home. It still feels like home today. It is hard to adequately describe how wonderful it is to have a real second home and for this only child with built-in sisters and a brother to boot. 
being part of the family meant that I was included in so many great adventures. A few of them included going to Disneyland first time when I was 12, nine, six. Uh, <laughs> camping trip in Wisconsin and riding the runaway horse and many day trips too numerous to mention. Aunt Eleanor helped a rather naive 16-year-old with fashion tips, which coincided with my finally starting to grow up and greatly help my confidence. And yes, unlike my mom, Aunt Eleanor did indeed know much about fashion and what was trendy at the time. What we now know to be inconsequential was huge at that point in my life. Truth be told, Aunt Eleanor unleashed the inner teenage clothes horse in this young man. <laughs> Fast forward to when great karma brought Nance and I together. Nance not only gained three new sisters, but Aunt Eleanor embraced Nance as she had embraced me as one of her children. The love and warmth between Aunt Eleanor and Nance was a two-way street. Indeed, on one of our visits to Aunt Eleanor just a few weeks ago, the few times Aunt Eleanor responded verbally and always appropriately, it was only to Nance. In the past handful of years, Nance and I enjoyed our annual trips to Florida over New Year's. Very special time spent with Aunt Eleanor and Uncle Mick, just the four of us hanging out at home in the dry dock restaurant, talking about everything and anything and laughing all the time. These, visit were, these visits were precious to us and our siblings, were always gr very gracious in sharing mom and dad with us. It is said that life is for the living, and indeed that is how our memories protect and cherish them, those whom we love, but are no longer physically present. So for me, for Nance, and for all of us, we'll miss being able to reach out and touch, but Aunt Elna will remain alive and well, her presence continuing to be a comfort for all. You should do something with your writing, she'd always say. Well, Mom, this is written for you with love. Eleanor, the great encourager, a wife, a mother, mom to her son-in-laws, a sister, a sister-in-law, an aunt, a friend. But her favorite name, Grandma. From the moment I met her in Alyssa's kitchen on Keeler, asking me questions, sizing me up, probably saying, is this guy worth it? Is this the right guy for Alyssa? The right guy for Tyler and Abe? And eventually Seth and Josh? My heart was pounding. Was I nervous? Hell yes, I was nervous. Yet I knew this was not an inquisition. It was just the beginning. A beginning of a conversation that had no period, just a comma. She was such a brilliant mind. Always aching to learn in order to teach. The essence of a matriarch. And when she spoke, we all listened. In the Weiner family, she was the only one I could speak sports to, except Bobby. I was still playing ball back then, and she would call me a weekend warrior. We'd laugh over a cold beer or a sobering conversation. 
one of the great storytellers of all time, leaving us always wanting more, supportive to her core. Each and every one of us knew it. A lover of family, peerless, as a matter of fact. Her love was designated for each and every one of us, and we all felt it. We all try to make it through this journey of life, broken pieces within our souls, but we're human, never knowing where the path will take us and who will cross that path. Mom, I was blessed to cross paths with you and to be your son-in-law. I will miss your voice, your lessons, your laughter, your hugs, your kisses, your brisket, <laughs> and love. One thing is for sure, the conversation will be ongoing. After all, there is no period, just a comma. Her favorite name, grandmother, grandma, so I'd like to invite Ayal up to say a few words. And the whole clan, stand strong, guys. So I'm... Uh, Come over. <laughs> You're orchestrating. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm glad to be here with, uh, or glad that my cousins cousins are here with me, um, standing with me. Uh, I'm going to share a few memories of my grandma uh, that I treasure and are will always be a part of me. And while I'm sharing my own words and memories, I know for sure that each of you have uh, your own similar shared memories with grandma. Uh, she was a woman who shared her great positivity, uh, warmth, wit, and was always making sure that we were all cared for uh, and making each of us feel special and loved. So an early memory, uh, rewind to New Year's Eve 1998. Uh, many of us were alive. Uh, us grandkids, we were presented with an offer. We were presented with an offer that New Year's to sleep at Grandma and Grandpa's house that night. And in, also, in hindsight, uh, we, it was an offer we could not refuse because our parents were so probably excited uh, <laughs> to have a night to themselves. Again, in hindsight, that was absolutely the case. Anyhow, Grandma, with her wisdom and again, her characteristic sense of humor, uh, wrote up a contract with terms for us to agree to in order to be allowed to sleep over. And thanks to Ilana, I have an actual copy of this now famous agreement. <laughs> in my grandmother's handwriting, of course, and I will read it to you and you guys also too. We signed this. <laughs> uh, contract for New Year's Eve, 1998-1999, at Grandma and Grandpa's. Let it be known to all that everyone under 20 years old sleeping over at Grandma and Grandpa's house agree to get ready to sleep by 12.30 a.m. and agree to have lights out by 1 a.m. They must also agree to listen to any and all adults for whatever reason. <laughs> we, in turn, guarantee a fun time for all with lots of good food. Signed, Tyler, Ariel, Abe, Ilana, and myself, Ayal. Um, my signature has improved slightly. <laughs> Anyhow, we all signed, and uh, so it was really with Grandma and Grandpa that we entered our first legally binding contract. <laughs> uh, a good one. And another memory uh, is of uh, growing up is, uh, and a highlight was visiting grandma's house, getting to see Chloe there talking and singing Parrot. Uh, and Chloe scared most of us, uh, and the adults too, because he would bite and nip if you got too close. But he was different with grandma. Uh, she had a special way with him, and she'd frequently sing and hum to him and put him to bed with his special song, 
Good night, Chloe. <laughs> and, and with all this singing and time with her, he, uh, he learned to mimic her voice quite well. And he'd sing along to her with her songs, and they'd actually sometimes harmonize together. <laughs> like, really. Um, and he learned that when the phone rang, or someone knocked at the door, it was appropriate to yell, hello, <laughs> in unison with her or whoever was picking up. Again, he was mimicking her voice specifically. And I remember her also uh, singing sped up versions of Yiddish folk songs where she'd get him bobbing up and down. So it looked almost like headbanging at a rock concert. Uh, but he was singing, or he was dancing, and kind of singing along with her uh, Yiddish leader, her Yiddish music. And parrots can live a long time. Uh, so Chloe is actually alive and well, uh, living with Ari in Skokie. <laughs> and it's comforting for me to know that our grandma's voice literally lives on in the form of a green and red macaw parrot in Ari's appointment, apartment that still greets you with, hello, when you walk in the door. And a final memory, um, a bit more recent, when her memory started to go, uh, go downhill um, in the last few years of her life, and she would start to get more forgetful. And she, at meals or gatherings or even one-on-one, -on -one, would start to, to tell stories more than once, forgetting that she'd already done so. And in these moments, even as I, or even in these moments, I, I didn't want to embarrass or try to worry her, so I would try to act as if it was the first time I'd heard her tell such story today. Um, I know we all remember that. And, but she had also a way of seeing through my expressions, though I, I thought I was quite convincing. And she'd clearly notice something was off and would stop, and with kind of a self-aware but also a bit of a sad smile say, I was just testing you to see if you were paying attention the first time. She was aware, and even though she was losing her memory, and I can only imagine how scary and hard that was for her, um, a lesson that I've attempted to internalize from that and work on is uh, to be able to turn that playful humor uh, into a coping mechanism and use it during my own hard times. So just a few moments of that I remember with Grandma. I know we remember with Grandma. And love you. That's it. Thanks. I was a junior in college, studying in Jerusalem for my junior year abroad. The joke was that I went over to Israel to find the woman of my dreams from the Middle East, and I found the woman of my dreams from the Middle West. <laughs> and Dawn's parents were coming to town before Pesach and I was going to meet them. And I remember the look of shock on Eleanor and Mickey's and especially Dawn's eyes when they came into my dorm room because it was a few days before Passover. And in Jerusalem, all the haircuts were crew cuts. And all my were gone. <laughs> The reason is because you don't get a haircut for 50 days between Passover and Shavuot. Everyone was doing crew cuts that week. I didn't know that until they spun me around to look in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> but Dawn told me that her mom loved Yiddish songs. And I only knew one at the time, Tumbala Laika. And I knew that that was good, but it wouldn't cut it if I was going to impress this woman, hopefully. This is the song I learned for her. And we have sung it countless times over the years. And the 
song worked. She let me marry her daughter. Oi fin pripachuk, brent a fire ill, un in stub is ace. Un de rabbit ler in kleiner kinder lach, dem alle bees. Un de rabbit ler in kleiner kinder lach, dem alle bees. Gdensche Kinder lach, Gdensche Teire, was hier lehren du. Sog je noch amol, und take noch amol, komm mit alle wohl. Sog je noch amol, und take noch amol, komm mit alle Gdensche Kinder lach, Gdensche Teire, wo sie lehren du. Sog sie noch amol und take noch amol, komm mit alle wo. Sog sie noch amol und take noch amol, komm mit alle wo. Mickey, it was such a privilege to sit with your family. I guess it was yesterday, it seemed a while ago. And Rabbi, such a privilege that you entrust me with this moment so that you could be Eitan. And you have quite an extraordinary family, but you already know that. And Eleanor knew that. She was the daughter of Robert and Fanny who probably because of the pogroms came here from the Ukraine. Fanny had a hard time of it back in the days, the story and the family story that is told over and over again, a miscarriage, maybe two, a stillborn, a child who died of flu. That's incredible trauma. And then successes, Herman and Abe and Bernice and baby Eleanor. And we can say all of that with just one quick phrase, how did they get here? How did they end up on the west side? But just to pause for a moment, all the details that must have gone behind those words, how the family was embedded in trauma and tragedy. The stories from the old country usually not told in the details that they were experienced and certainly not told in the emotional toll it took upon the life. And not only that, but Robert died, was hit by a bus on his 49th birthday. The tragedy and the trauma of this family continued. And this could have meant that Eleanor was angry or pessimistic or depressed or moody or fearful, or just plain cranky. But as all you know, that's not what happened. Something in that woman, some kind of fortitude and resilience, some kind of refusal to give in to the tragedy, made her be the optimistic and compassionate person that you all have called her. Her father died when she was 12, and it was at 14, Mickey, that you met her. I just connected that 
last night or this morning as I was writing the eulogy, just a couple of years old, and you were a sage 15 years old. Story goes, and you'll tell it in more detail another time to your family. You, she went to visit a friend. You happened to be outside with a bunch of cousins. You were playing handball. She said, can I play too? You guys said, OK. I imagine some of you said, what, a girl? And of course, she won. <laughs> and then she said, will you walk me home? And you asked permission because you were just kids. And you walked her home, Bill oftentimes chaperoning. You went to movies. You went to dances at Marshall. And finally, you married, 20 and 21. Mickey, I asked what she saw in you. And you said, well, I think of all the guys she went out with, and there weren't a whole lot of years of that, apparently. Fanny liked you best. I said, yeah, but why did she like you from such a young age? How did she know that she loved you? And you said, well, I guess she would say that I was a gentleman, agreeable, respectful, and we all know that to be true about you. And then you did offer the sage advice to all of us who were listening and your children were listening very carefully. You said, you know, it was a lot of give and take. When she really wanted something, I gave in. And when I really wanted something, she gave in. That yielding for love was the secret of your marriage. And for you, why did you love her? You said, I don't know. I suppose it was love at first sight. You both studied to be pharmacists. And while she was in the middle of the school, you were sent by the Army to serve at, in Newport, Virginia, on the Chesapeake Bay, close to home for me. So she left school, of course, to join you. And Robin was born. They came back to Chicago, and she finished school. And the story goes, pregnant, very pregnant, eight months with Don. She went before a panel, and they said, Mrs. Minor, when are you going to give birth? And she looked at her watch, and she said, any moment now. <laughs> and so the panel only asked her one question, and she was dismissed. <laughs> and she walked that stage, very, very pregnant, but walked it nevertheless. I asked you about that, and you said to me, you know, in those days, it was 10% women in pharmacy school. Today, it's about 70%. I said, was it hard? You said, I, I don't know. Um, but I'm here to tell you who was not there, it was hard. The only woman to have a career, the only woman, one of the few women in school, it was for sure hard to be that kind of renegade, that kind of trailblazer. She worked retail for a little while, Bethesda Hospital. She became the director of pharmacy. She had to travel quite a bit, so she was leaving the children. Weiss Hospital for 15 years, Shriners Hospital, where she retired from. And you kept telling me more of her resume, which was so extraordinary, on the forefront of mail order pharmacy. Good with doctors who trusted her and often took her aside to ask her advice as to what medication she should give. On the forefront of chemotherapy, on the forefront of creating the compounds. She was not only the one that filled them, but she actually mixed the chemistry. On the forefront of computerization. I'm telling you, it wasn't easy to be her as a professional, and it bubbled to the top for sure. And as I said to you yesterday, Mickey, and I'll say it here again, with all these people, it really, really matters who you marry because she was able to accomplish professionally what she accomplished, because just like when you were kids, it was only love and respect. And when I said, well, how did you do it? You didn't even understand the question. Of course you did it. Her first thought was to be an English teacher. 
She loved to read and continued to be an avid reader her whole life, Mark Twain, Louisa May Alcott, her fa favorite poet, Carl Sandburg, and I'm sure many, many more. As you heard, she loved the arts, music. She was going to have some kind of family uh, band. So you all took up an instrument. It had to be an instrument that could be in an orchestra, harp, piano, violin, flute, clarinet, or cl cl clarinet, cello, and Robin and Mom duets for sure. And of course, her favorite song, which is so appropriate now. And these, these are a few of my favorite things. She sang in Yiddish. That song moved us all so much. She wrote plays. She was active and an activist, probably really a socialist at heart, striking with Chicago public schools, volunteering at Beth El, a mentor to young kids that were growing up through the ranks, people who became famous in this world, like Gary Zola and Arie Ariel, who wrote a beautiful message to you. She was social. No one stayed a stranger for long, even in a restaurant. Phone numbers were exchanged. They loved parties, pina coladas. In her heart, there was always one more room, one room for one more person. She was the organizer. She had a clique called the Weiner Family Group, organized retreats. My guess is some of you are here. And when she talked to you, Eric kind of mentioned this, she would lock eyes with you as if you were the only person in the world. Because frankly, I believe that you are the only person in the world. She was positive, not just by action, but also teaching you kids the power of positivity. You each have your own stories of how your life was so difficult. Alyssa, when Dean died, and you couldn't have done it without your family, and for sure not without your mother. Robin, those first semester exams, the first day on the job. Scott, even though we didn't get to talk yesterday, the family, the sisters wanted me to say the story about that poem that you wrote in the, as a triangle, and the teacher said, oh my god, something's wrong with this kid. You have to come in right away. And the poem was in the shape of a triangle, and at the bottom of it said, and that was the point. It was a brilliant, creative, <laughs> creative poem in the second grade. And she saw in you a creative and an artist. She knew who you were, who you are. And Don, you wanted me to make sure that I read Cherish moments with family, lots of food and hugs, always music to surround us. In our heart, so much love. And the four of you have so much more to say. And your obligation, along with your spouses, is to tell those stories over and over again to those kids who really do want to hear it. It's not going to be hard to tell the stories. 25 years in Florida, you would come and they would say, Mickey and Eleanor are back. They prolonged your life. There was so much laughter, so much humor. The son-in-laws never understood when crowds of people got together and there was a mother-in-law joke. They said, yeah, you know, I'm out because there is no joke here. Only love. Only love. And when I asked you last night, what about the grandchildren? I don't know if you remember this, but collectively I said, so what about the grandchildren? And you said, ah, just like that. And seeing them stand up here all together and how you so beautifully started to tell some of the memories, more, more to come. Cuddly and warm, she loved you so much. And you loved her. These kids formed a circle of love around this woman every other week, all coming to dinner. Not because it was easy, certainly not in the last year, 
where her mind was playing tricks on her. And you showed up, and I got to tell you something. Presence is the only thing that matters. And you're saying, well, of course. And I'm telling you, not necessarily. You kids were magnificent. She didn't want to die. That determination kept her alive way longer than her mind could hold. She didn't want to let go. She didn't want to leave you. But you knew her and she knew you. And you knew what she would say to you right this minute because I asked you and you just told me. And so I, as her voice will tell it to you right now, she would want you to know right this moment, laugh. Have fun, entertain, bring people into your homes. Take care of each other. Say words of love. Take care of yourselves. She was so incredibly proud of you. She has been your purpose for so long. You have been faithful and dedicated, and loyal, and of one heart, taking care of your mother and your father. She would want you to know that she is so grateful. And she loves you so very much. May her memory be for a blessing. Please rise. With the chanting of El Malay Rahamim, we ask that Eleanor's legacy live on, that it live on through the stories, through the memories through the relationships, through all her deeds of goodness and loving kindness, through all that she did to make this world a better place. Hamitze menucha nechona, tachat kan veashina. Im kedoshim o teorim, kezohar haraki hamazirim, et nishmat elke. Bat reuvenu fegel, shehalecha leholama. Baal harachamim, yasnireha veseter kenafav liolamim. Vayitror bitror chayim et nishmata. Adonai unachalata. Vetanuach b'shalom al mishkava v'nomar Amen. May our hearts be open to compassion and our eyes to wisdom that we might glimpse in perfect peace and sadness the way of all things. May the memory of Eleanor Weiner the daughter of Robert and Fanny, who is known in Jewish tradition as Elka Bat Reuvenu Fegel. Be for us a blessing. And may we never let the light of her love grow dim in our hearts. 
May we remember all her worthy and righteous deeds, that her memory be forever bound up in the bond of life. For the eternal one is our source and our destination and our beginning and our end. And so may the death of Eleanor Weiner awaken us to this truth that the bond of love we shared will not be severed in sorrow. May she rest in peace. Vinamar, and we say, Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, the interment service will continue at Memorial Park Cemetery. The family will be returning to the Weiner residence at 3115 West Sherwin Avenue in Chicago following the interment until 7 p.m. Saturday evening from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Sunday from 2 to 4.30 and then 6.30 to 9 p.m. Please note the times and be respectful of those times as well. The Shiva coordinator is Karen Thurman. That information is on the service folder. Memorial donations or contributions to the Chicago Mitzvah campaign or Shir Hadash Synagogue would be appreciated. That information is also on the service folder. And ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who are joining us via live stream, all that information is on the website. For those of you who will be joining us in the procession, please obtain an orange safety funeral sticker to place on the right-hand side of your windshield. Have your bright lights and hazard lights on at all times. For additional measures of safety, we will be providing a car in the back of the procession to hopefully keep other cars from entering the procession. Please use your horn liberally as you're going through the intersections. Please do not speak or text on your cellular phone while driving to the cemetery. At this time, I invite her grandchildren to come forward to serve as pallbearers, Ayal Weiner Kaplow, Milana Weiner Kaplow, Ariel Galante, Joe Galante, Tyler, Abe, Seth, Josh Shore. This time I invite everyone to please rise and stand in place. Ladies and gentlemen, please keep in mind just one more thing. You can exit over here, or really two more things. And then for those of you who are not going to the cemetery, please exit the parking lot as soon as you can so we can establish a dignified procession to the cemetery. Thank you. 